Hello? Hey, Rich. Ready to record another show? What? Didn't we just do this like like a week or two ago? Yeah. Well, so what gives? What are you doing here again so soon? You shouldn't be coming back for a couple more weeks at least, should you? Oh, no, Rich. Those days are gone. We're going to have a show every other week. What? And that gets my goat every week. Really? Yeah. Hell, I'll probably even do an ankle cast once a month, too. What? I... Hey, can, can you help me so I can finally get the Rich Outcast going, too? <laughs> oh, let's not get too crazy. Mm, okay. Oh, who am I kidding? Yes, I'll help you. We're going to do it all, sir. Wow, I, I can't believe it. Big's finally excited about the show again. I've waited so long for this day. The computer is on, the mics are out. Announcer man's not whining about his gout. Who knew Big's baby could sleep more than an hour? For a year we've done one show a month. Let me tell you, dude, that is no fun. It's all plugged in, Big's turning on the power. We'll be sharing another story. Announcer man will probably scream. No it's a singing. great time to be on the June Steve team. Cause for the first time in forever, and they'll be laughing, they'll be fun. For the first time in forever, and there'll be two episodes in a month. Don't know if I'm elated or gassy. Well, I guess that answers that. Cause for the first time in forever. Oh, dude, come on. Oh, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm sorry, man. I, I ate a chili dog at your wiener schnitzel, and it's apparently not done with me yet. Oh, man. <coughs> That's freaking <coughs> awful. What? It's not like you don't fart when we're recording all the time, too. Now I remember why we only do this once a month. Oh, the smell never bothered me anyway. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Announcer Man is here. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Time. Flowing like a river. To the sea. To the sea? Welcome everybody to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm confused. You're, you're Rish Outfield. Yes. Yes, whatever you say. Okay, good, good. We're back again for another episode. Today's story is by a returning author. His name is uh, Tobias Harris. Harris Tobias. Actually. Harris Tobias? No, come right, on. Right, Tobias Harris. Wait, now I don't know. Part of his name is Harris, and the other part is Tobias. One of his names is Harris, and his uh, one of his other. Okay, yes. Harris Harris Tobias is our, our returning author. Uh, you may remember him from such instructional films as. No, he did episode one hundred and thirteen for us, which was the troop, and episode ninety three, which was the alarm. You sure it wasn't the alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just the alarm. Yeah, no, but he's done a ton of voices. For... Oh no, no. I'm thinking of L. Scribe Harris Tobias. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. So, so he's back for this is his third go round. Uh, today's story is called Time Pressure. And uh, it's a good one. Yeah, we have such a vast voice cast on this one that we probably should get right to the story. Yeah, we can go ahead and do that. Um, and now, a word about the author. Oh, thank you, Announcer Man. Hey, oh, Announcer Man is here with us. I, 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 I forgot. Yeah, well, he did introduce us at the start of the episode. You might have remembered that. But you were already so confused that I guess it's not surprising. Yeah, the, the Pink Floyd thing derailed all. <laughs> it, it put everything that was in my head out of my head. Ah. It was nice, though. Yes, because usually what's in your head deserves to be out of anyone's head. Harris Tobias lives... Uh, Tobias Harris. 
See, even he gets it wrong sometimes. Even he gets it Wow, he mixes his names up backwards. Okay. Harris Tobias lives and writes in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is the author of two detective novels, The Greer Agency and A Felony of Birds. You know what my favorite Felony of Birds song is? It's uh, You're Gonna Think I Ran So Far Away, but it's actually Space Age Love Song. Oh, okay, well, good. He is also the author of several short story collections and a number of children's books, including At the Robot Zoo, Moon Rivet Saves His Skin, and An Alphabet Book of Bugs. All of his books are available in print and as ebooks. You can find his fiction at the link that's in the show notes. Cool. The story you're about to hear, Time Pressure, was first published by the online sci-fi magazine Quantum Muse. It is currently part of a collection of 15 time travel stories published under the name Chronon, A Particle of Time. Available in print and as an ebook and an audiobook. Really? So somebody has already done an audio version of this story? Sort of. In a way. What do you mean? I don't know what I mean. What do you mean? What? The Pink Floyd thing made me confused. Ah, okay, that's all right. <laughs> um, we don't need no education, really. That's right. Let's uh, go on with the story. Ah, uh, yes, that's probably a good idea. On with the show. Time Pressure by Harris Tobias The scene in front of my visor is dark and murky, like seeing the world through maple syrup, sort of brown and thick. Moving is slow and plodding. I feel like a deep-sea diver at a dangerous depth. The pressure of time above me threatens to squeeze me into jelly. My name is Jay Cramp. I'm a chrononaut, and I'm on a mission. Time is thick, thick as soup, and the deeper you travel into the past, the heavier and denser it becomes. It has to do with the physics of time, something scientists have been getting wrong for generations. Until now... Now we finally understand that time is particulate in nature. A flowing stream of chronons surround and engulf every instant of reality. A single month's worth of chronons can barely be weighed with any instrument. A year's worth registers faintly on our most sensitive scales. Five years down, the pressure accumulates to several atmospheres. It's a logarithmic scale like the one they use for earthquakes... At the depth I'm at now, 46.22 years, it's like being at the bottom of the Pacific. Time is dense, dangerous, and the going is slow. We used to think that time was like a river. How naive we were. Time isn't like that at all. It's like sediment. I wear armor. You wouldn't last a nanosecond in the past without a chrono suit. The stresses on frail biology are immense, too severe to survive without protection. The past is as inhospitable as outer space. The weight of it wants to crush you like an egg. Special equipment is needed, and even then, it's difficult. The past is not a friendly place. I've trained hard for this assignment. I'm in excellent shape, tough both physically and mentally. The Corps only sends the best on these missions. With this insertion, I have surpassed the previous record. The Chinese tagged us September 23, 2005, in our embassy in Beijing. It was an astounding feat, and it shook our defense establishment to its core. It was like a splash of cold water in the face, and it had the same effect. The Chinese record has stood for 16 years, and has made my government very nervous. It was a Sputnik moment. We went to work, and developed the armor I am wearing now. 
It's pretty sophisticated stuff. The best materials our industries can produce. It's made from souped-up spider silk. Lightweight and very strong. At this very moment, I am eight months deeper than the Chinese. My gauge says it's February 13th, 2005. Take that, you slanty-eyed mothers. <clears throat> Time travel has become a game that rich nations play. A sort of geopolitical tag. The my country can go deeper than yours game has become the space race of the late 21st century. A game of high-tech one-upmanship. I am two blocks from the insertion point, and everything is working well. I have no communication with my present. If there is an accident, no one will ever know. My wife and daughter will be well taken care of, unless I do something stupid and cause their non-existence. That is the real danger. You have to be oh so careful. Disturbing the timeline, even a little, can have ramifications in the future, and I would hate to do anything to hurt my family or my country. So... I move slowly and carefully and concentrate on my mission. I take careful steps, try to remain focused, but I can't help being human, and stray thoughts flit into my consciousness. Tomorrow is my daughter's birthday. I have to pick up a gift. She's nine years old. I love her so much. The stray thoughts do nothing to calm my racing heart. I have to be careful. I don't want to cause an incident, or I might not have a present to return to, or a present to buy, or a present so different I wouldn't recognize it. The sediment of time can be disturbed in small ways, without any noticeable effect on the future. Time is forgiving that way. But do something big, and you can really mess things up. Messing things up is my greatest fear. I move slowly as I have been trained. I have no obvious presence in the past. The inhabitants cannot see me just as I cannot see them. I can barely see solid objects, and even those are difficult to see clearly. Living things are blurry wraiths without substance. To the people whose present this is, I am invisible. They flit across my vision as insubstantial as soap bubbles. It's strange that what is thick, almost impenetrable to me, is just air to them. Something about the relativism of time. I don't pretend to understand it. I don't think anyone really does. I take small, swimming steps, as though lifting lead weights with each step. I carry a message for the Chinese ambassador. He will, I'm sure, be shocked to receive it. He will report its contents to his superiors, and eventually they will know we have gone deeper and that the past is ours, at least for a little while. They, in turn, will not rest until they are once again time's masters, and so it goes until either some absolute limit is reached or one of us goofs up and changes the future for good. The country that can deliver the earliest message could, in theory, deliver a bomb. The actual result of sending a bomb into the past is purely theoretical. No one is foolish enough to actually do it. Time is the perfect playground for the military. The nation that can travel deeper into the past wins. Billions are spent and no one gets hurt. It's all fun and games, until someone screws up. You change the past and you endanger the future, and that future is where we all live. It's where my life is, my loving family, my sweet daughter. The future is where I fully expect to return to my comfortable, familiar present. You better believe I'm careful. The guards don't see me as I walk right past them. They are not watching for me. They are watching for threats from their own time, not a visitor from their future. I wait for the door to open. I could open it myself, but why risk even a small disturbance? Reliable data is scarce, 
but it appears we are reaching the limit to how deep in the past we can go. Of course, at one time, we thought the limit was 11 years, and now look at how deep we've gone. Science and technology keep whittling away at the barrier. Who knows how deep we can ultimately go? Once inside the building, I climb the stairs slowly. Each step takes tremendous effort. I dare not take the elevator. I have a relative weight of several tons. It wouldn't do to snap an elevator cable and cause a causal rift. So I take the stairs and plod slowly up three flights. On the third floor landing, I pause for breath. The clock on the wall says 4 p.m. Right on schedule. After a short rest, I continue to the ambassador's office. I stand in a corner straining to see the ambassador. There he is. I drop the message on his desk. To him, it would look like it suddenly appeared out of thin air. I imagine him looking around, bewildered. As far as I know, the letter says something like, This message is from the future. Be sure to tell your government that you have been tagged by the United States. It is imperative that you report that this letter was found on your desk. Something like that, anyway. I love that word, tagged. Now the Chinese are it. My mission completed. I turn and retrace my steps. Halfway down the steps, something strange happens. I encounter a chrono-suited time traveler making his way up. This is unprecedented. The past is, after all, a vast territory, so the odds on meeting another time traveler in the same location at the same time is off the charts. This person, whoever he is, must have known I'd be here. His suit is a crude, old-fashioned, bulky thing cobbled together with bits and pieces from the early days of time exploration. I feel sorry for the guy. Moving around in this soup is tough enough in state-of-the-art gear. For him, it must have been ten times harder. He moves with painful slowness, dragging a heavy container behind him. We freeze in our tracks, glaring at each other. The fact that we can see each other so clearly means we are from the same present. His out-of-date, homemade suit tells me he is not Chinese. He isn't part of our little game, and therefore not bound by its rules. The fact that he picked this particular time and place to appear means he is most likely up to no good. My mind searches for some explanation. We stand frozen in place for several seconds. I can see he is gathering his strength, contemplating his next move. Then he reaches into a zippered pocket and pulls out a knife. This is bad. Very bad. Even a small puncture in a chrono suit at this depth would be a disaster. The sudden decompression would cause an explosion that would certainly change the past. I couldn't take a chance that he wouldn't try and puncture his own suit like a suicide bomber. I gather my wits and allow my combat training to take over. I have always been good at hand-to-hand -hand combat. I leap down the steps and knock him off his feet. We tumble down the remaining steps, locked in a deadly embrace. He swipes at me with his knife. Luckily, my suit doesn't tear. I duck under his thrust, grab his wrist in a twisting move, and bring him to his knees, his arm behind him. The knife falls silently to the floor. He has no strength left to fight with. He lays there, inert. I use the strap attached to the bag he was dragging to tie him with, and drag them both down the steps, out the door, and back the way I'd come. It takes all my strength to accomplish this. His booted feet stick out before us, his eyes stare into mine. What I see staring back are the eyes of a fanatic. I drag him back to my insertion point, and wait for the extraction chamber to materialize. I look through the fanatic's bag and see... and see it is filled with enough explosives to have brought down the whole embassy. The extraction chamber isn't big enough to carry everything. I stuff my prisoner, and as much of the explosives as I can, into the chamber, and climb in on top. It's a tight fit. I have to leave a lot of the explosives behind. I only hope that when the DC police find them, it doesn't cause too much of an incident. 
Who am I kidding? The overloaded chamber rises slowly and carries us forward in time like an elevator rising from the depths, lifting us back to the present. When we arrive, I am relieved to find things pretty much the same as I left it. I say pretty much because there are a few small changes that catch my attention. I notice, for example, that my boss, Major Gerard, has a mustache where before he had none. My prisoner is taken away in handcuffs. I find out later that he belonged to a militant ethnic group desperate for independence. He meant to blow up the past and let the pieces fall where they may. His bomb would have been blamed on the U.S. The repercussions for the world would not have been pretty. Major Gerard puts me in for a medal for capturing the terrorist and saving the world. After several days of debriefing, I am allowed to go home. I have to hunt for my car in the parking lot. The white car I drove to the base is now a dark blue. Luckily, I remember my daughter's birthday. I stop at a store and buy flowers and candy for Gladys and an expensive doll for Mary. The credit card I use to pay for the purchase looks strangely different than the one I was used to. I am not alarmed. These changes are so minor I can easily live with them. I am just so happy to be home safe and sound, and in my familiar present. I pull into my driveway, and a dog I had never seen before barks at me. The house is different in a dozen small ways. Shape, size, landscaping. I'm just getting my head around that when the front door opens, and a woman I don't recognize flies into my arms and tells me how glad she is I'm home. She is followed by a six-year-old boy who runs into my arms. Bewildered, I hand them my gifts. My son looks askance at the doll. I make a joke about it and try to make the best of an embarrassing situation. about today's story. My name is Harris Tobias, and I am a science fiction story writer. I love to write about time travel. It's a real challenge to an author to say something new about it. Uh, it's such a tired and well-traveled theme in science fiction that to come up with a new idea and be original is quite a challenge. For some time, I'd been toying with the idea that time might be like a particle, a subatomic particle, something like an electron or a neutrino. And if that was so, if it was particulate in nature, then perhaps the past it, it lies buried under layers of these particles, like sediment on the bottom of the sea. I call these particles chronons. And the further back one went into the past, the, the denser and, and heavier these layers of time became. I, I saw time travel comparable to deep sea diving. The story followed from this premise, that time travelers were plodding along in slow motion, being careful and not to interfere too much with the past. And it became a generally useless pursuit uh, among rich nations, like a geopolitical tag game. And uh, I was describing that, and the fight with a temporal terrorist came into my head, and the whole new level of tension came into the story. And their disturbance of the past led to the super curious ending where the, the present was changed in subtle, unpredictable ways. So that was how time pressure was born. But the whole theme of time travel uh, is still very much uh, alive with me. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.
and time is flowing like a river. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. You know, this was the second Harris Tobias story that was all Harris one. Tobias joint sorry I pass, interrupted pass me the Dutch on the left hand side would you <laughs> the left hand side okay uh, there you go no no the other one the true was just one narrate, one reader and no other characters spoke or any of that stuff it, I think the uh, aliens did go like a couple times though oh okay in that one anyways well, were, were there any noises in this one I don't, well, maybe there was noises when he fought the terrorist, but there wasn't, like, speaking. There was just... <laughs> maybe we can port over the, the noises from the troop. And use there you go. One. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the shortest turnaround we've ever had on a, a Dune Steve, right? Probably. Although, if we really went down to it, I'd say maybe not. Oh, like the very first few If you episodes. want to go back to our first few episodes, we had some quick turnarounds in those days. But probably the shortest turnaround in the last three to four years. Yeah, because when we first started up the podcast, if we got a submission, it was like, hey, we got a submission. And we would read it immediately because we would get one or two a week. So, yeah, I can imagine the turnaround being much quicker in those days. But in this, in this case... Harris sent us this story. When did he send it, do you think? Uh, it says here he sent it Wednesday, May 15th, 2013. Okay, so he sent it in May, and I don't know when When we, we actually it. saw it, September 16th was when I forwarded it over to the other account so that I could read it. Okay, so you read it back in September. I read it, and I liked the story. I don't know if you liked it. I did. But... I felt like, wow, there, there could be so much more. I, I want to know more. I want to know more about this guy. I want to know what he feels being a chrononaut. I want to know how he responds when he goes back and things are, are changed. And so I emailed Harris and I said, uh, would you mind you know adding in a little bit more to this? And uh, he did it immediately. Like in the space of a week, we had the story again. Um, and then I didn't read it. I didn't read it for months. When does it say I find? I'm guessing in December. It, was, it looks like probably around uh, Christmas you read it, and uh, finally decided that we were going to take it as well, is. Right. Nicole had sent us an email saying, "Hey, did you guys read this? You know, you asked him to send a new version, and then he sent it. Do you want to tackle that, or should I read it?" Or, and I was just like, oh, shoot, let me sit down and read it. And it's a short story, as you noticed. And so I was able to sit down and, and read it. And uh, I think the same day, I thought, well, I'll just record this thing. Because it's just one character. In fact, I might have emailed you and said, do you want to do this? And before you had responded, I had already recorded <laughs> it myself. I don't know. Does that sound wrong? Uh, that could be the truth. I can't remember that either. I'm sorry. I just... I felt bad because I had asked him to make these changes, and then I hadn't read what he had sent us. Uh, and so I, I felt like, well, okay, I'll, I'll go the extra mile on this one. Hence, the turnaround was considerably shorter for this story than for most. I, mean, I guess it's still kind of a long turnaround it's, when you actually give us the dates. Yeah, the when you go all the way back and, and find out that it was first sent to us, in May, then it seems like it's a little longer because it still comes out being like six or seven months. But from the time that we decided to take it to the time that it's on air, and all that is a way faster turnaround than normal. Usually we're like, okay, yes, we'll take your story. And then we put it at the bottom of the list of stories to be produced, and it waits its turn. And in this case, it, it didn't wait its turn. It just got produced immediately after you read it. And uh, here we are. It's only been a few weeks, and we're already putting it up onto the feed. Well, but part of it is the type of story that it is. If it is just a one-person narrator story with minimal sound effects, then, yeah, those are easy to produce. That's basically an escape pod, or one of those single-reader stories is. Right. And if we did single-reader stories on our show, we would be up to like three or 400 episodes. Yeah, probably. 
because you could do one and I could do one. We'd ask Brian to do one. We'd ask Renee to do about nine. <laughs> and, and, you know, once they're edited, then we they, we put them out. And uh, we could still talk about them like we're doing right now. And so there would be a lot more episodes. But for some reason, and why do you suppose we decided to do full cast when we first started the show? Um, yeah, it's funny because we didn't really go f- full cast to begin with. Gosh, I, I, I guess we might. I think we did start I think full the cast. The first episode was full cast. Yeah, I, I don't think there was any female characters, but it was full cast. We did have three different people doing voices. I do remember that. And the second episode, we had female voices on it, and I had my wife do the voices uh, of the female character. So you I had guess... a janitor do. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, I'll never let you forget that. I just <laughs> loved it. I had a janitor at work do the voice of the janitor on the story. Um, that would be so easy now with our little portable microphones. And that's stuff. true. The full cast thing, I guess we did do from the beginning. I was thinking more like sound effects and music and all that kind of stuff sort of evolved. Uh, we started, I think, we put very minimal sound effects. I believe the first story had a gunshot and maybe a car engine when the car drives and goes really fast. But I think that was it. And then, yeah, they steadily kind of grew and grew until... And I think that just evolves from the fact that both of us are film students. And so the more complete of a ambiance or whatever you want to say that we put in there, the more it feels like what we want it to be. Well, exactly. And And maybe the full cast is the same thing because, you know, hey, we want the females to sound like females and then et cetera, et cetera, because we're basically movie makers deep down that has made life way more difficult for us yes and let's just if we make an executive decision and stop it now (laughs) never again do that i was gonna say if we had (laughs) the capability of uh sifting through chronons and going back to 2008 when we first started the podcast maybe we would advise ourselves hey don't do full cast stories it's okay if you voice the women and children (laughs) But I don't know. We certainly wouldn't have met some of the great people that we've met. Definitely. Because we ask them, hey, would you do a voice on our show? I, I, have you ever heard somebody comment on how much they like or don't like the full cast aspect of our show? I think uh, a large amount of our audience uh, stick with us because, or at least got hooked on us to begin with because of that, because of the interesting difference that that is to what you can find everywhere else because most other places they don't do that do you know why because it's insane insane. because it's hard it's difficult it's stupid some places will do a full cast version you know every now and then i think drabblecast will do it every month or two or a couple of months or something like that and i i think even podcastle was doing full casts for special episodes like 200th episode or something like that but uh Yeah, nobody's dumb enough to try and do it every time, except for a very few really dumb people like us. And I think for a lot of people, maybe they're film people at heart too or something like that. But I think a lot of people really like that. And uh, it's what draws them to the show, I think, is that. I have heard many people comment about how uh, they enjoy our show because of that aspect. Okay, that's cool. See, I would have blocked out anything positive anybody ever said right. about the show and only focused on the negative. But uh, at the New Media Expo a few weeks ago, uh, Scott Sigler said that uh, the reason people listen to our podcast is because of our sparkling personalities. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. Which I, I was really impressed that he'd say that. pointed specifically at us and said they listen to your show because of your sparkling personality. And then we realized he was actually talking about the guys sitting behind us. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Oh, Thank you for bursting shoot. my bubble. I I thought that so he... So sorry about that. But, you know, now it makes a little bit more sense that when we talked to him afterward, he didn't know who we were. <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, please, change the subject. Now I'm, I'm feeling bad. But, yeah, I think that there's a few different selling points, I guess, of the show, and definitely the full cast thing is one of them. 
some stories lend themselves more to full cast than others and this is obviously not so full of a full cast i mean wouldn't even bother to do a cast list because the cast list is a cast of one yeah it's the rish outfield show today terrible well have we never done one where you just <laughs> only you narrated it uh and there were no other parts because see we did the voyage of the van leeuwen hook ah yes and I think that one was just me as well. I had one line in there. I, I said, dive, dive, in that one. <laughs> How is it you always ring that up? That's so I, weird. <laughs> I remember I had one tiny little line. You did. You um, say dive. Here and there, there's been a few that are like that where they, uh, I, I can't remember if I've done one where I'm the narrator and you have one line. But there may have been something like that. Well, the next time one comes in that's like that, you can narrate it and I will take a step back. Well, to tell you the truth, I bet we've got a fair number of close to that kind of stories with the triple word score stories. So that we may have one or two of those coming up here. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'll be the guy that does the voice. I know that, for one, we're letting a lot of uh, new producers cut their teeth on our triple word score stories. Because they're short, and so it's not as much of a undertaking to do for your first time out. And uh, so that works out well. And I think a lot of them are wanting to narrate themselves or something like that. And so you and I are getting to do just like two or three lines, which is cool because we're like, yeah, we're already done with that story. Moving on. Yeah, that sort of stuff is fun. Especially when we contribute in just a little tiny bit and then we listen to the finished product and it's like a brand new story. You know, and granted, we would have, except for Harlan's Wake, we would have, you know, read the story and reviewed it and sent it back forth and said, you want to do this one. But sometimes it's a year or two after that that the episode gets made. We listen to the story and it's just like, wow, I didn't even remember. <laughs> yeah, and, that our regular pace does cause that kind of thing to happen a fair amount because you know we're, we're running slow and meow yeah, by the time we finally get around to it oh yeah i don't remember what happens and you know yeah you do that all the time. you're like okay so what's going on here and i'm like dude i read it last the last time you read it come on why am i supposed to remember this well i listen to a lot more pink floyd than you do apparently ah is that it what tends it is? to do to my brain what drano does to clogged pipes Huh. In a good way. So, uh, if you don't mind, let us talk about Tainted Angels. Okay. Hey, that ain't funny, man. Time pressure. Uh, we've done a lot of time travel stories on the show, right? Yeah, we've done our fair share, I would say. We'll do uh, another one, I'm sure, before the year is through. If I can ever get off my butt and edit it. <laughs> and... Uh, we explained before, this is not a rerun. I love time travel. You love time travel stories. There's a thousand different ways to do a time travel story. And this one, like Harris said in his own author's note, it's it's unique. It's not... It's almost a banal form of time travel. You know what I mean? There's no adventure... I, mean, I guess in this case there is. But you can tell with this character that it's something... That has to be done very efficiently and maybe done the exact same way every single time. Very and carefully. You don't get to dick around in the past and buy some old baseball cards or any of that stuff. Yeah, you, you can't impregnate your own grandmother and become your own grandfather or something like and that. It, well, look, you really shouldn't do oh. that. Oh. It's just, it's not, it's not right. Yeah, I guess. There was that deleted that. scene in Back to the Future. <laughs> okay. Where, uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is totally fine. To do a, and I'm not saying that this story is boring in any way. It's just it, it's it's kind of like space travel around 1970, 71, 72. We'd gone to the moon, and eight times. Now people didn't care. Yeah, it's like that bit on Apollo 13 where they're doing their broadcast live from orbit, or not? I guess not even in orbit. They're you know on their way to the moon and they, they do their broadcast and. They find out that they got dropped by the network because it, the ratings were too low that they didn't even bother to show it. Yeah, yeah at the very beginning, they're interviewing the astronauts, and uh, Tom Hanks tries to make it sound exciting. And he's like, there's nothing routine about going to the moon, believe me. And 
everybody's like, yeah, well, yeah, it's yeah. not, it's not. And, and we've had a bunch of space conversations, you and me, and I, I do with my friend who sort of works with NASA sometimes about it. It's, it's a shame that it's considered so boring. It's a shame that there's, that it's not exciting like it was, you know, in the sixties when we had somebody we were competing against, when it was a race, when they would top us and then we would top them and then they would top us and it was escalation. But in a way it's like, well, obviously that's what's going on in this story with time travel, but it was a almost friendly competition. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the, I think he uses a phrase in here where he talks about it. You know, it, it is a warfare, but it's a bloodless warfare of one-upmanship rather than taking of lives and taking of, of ground and, 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 and this battle and that, you know, skirmish. Right, yeah. If, if, if China and the United States need to fight somehow, then, you know, this is a good way to do it. You have to, oh, we're topping you now by going four months earlier than you went. Because, yeah, nobody, well, girls change into boys and stuff, but for the most part, nobody gets hurt. Uh, anyway, that, that was an interesting aspect to it. But you've just brought up the more interesting aspect of the story. And someday, once we have a, a Wikipedia page of our own, uh, I, will, I will coin the phrase Ian's Law, oh. which is... <laughs> A story always ends at the point in which you wish it to begin. And it, he's wrong. Most stories don't. Most stories have a beginning, middle, and end. And when they end, you're like, well, of course, that was the end. Happy day. They kissed. But every once in a while, you get to a story where the ending comes. And then you're like, oh, no, 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 no. Please don't end. That's that, that, that. And I think in this case, that's a perfect example of Ian's law. Oh, the poor bastard loses his wife. And he loses his daughter, but he has a wife and he has a kid. They're just strangers to him. And that is a happy ending and also a terribly <laughs> unhappy ending. Just to follow this guy around for a week to find out what has changed and what sorts of things we all consider to be routine and, you know, it's just like, well, of course honeybees are extinct, Dad. What, what do you mean? That's why we have almond nut Cheerios. And he's like, no, 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 it should be honey nut Cheerios. It's like, we don't use that the H word anymore, Dad. <laughs> um, that kind of stuff is just fascinating to me. And I, I, I love the idea of timelines getting changed or and things, ripples, ripples throughout the timeline is one of the best things about time, time travel. travel. In Back to the Future, at the very end, when he goes back to the mall and the name of the mall has changed from the opening scene, picking up on that as a kid made me feel like oh, the potential for time travel is, oh my goodness. I, I, and, you know, I was young enough when Back to the Future came out that I hadn't seen that before. It's just like, now it's Lone Pine Mall and it was Twin Pine Mall before. Oh my gosh. That kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. This could definitely have a sequel time pressure too where you follow this guy around and see now what his life is like and how he deals with that how he i mean he makes the best of an embarrassing situation but yeah you know how do you deal with that this woman he doesn't recognize that flies into his arms is her name going to be gladys or is it going to be something completely different well here's the thing how do you first find out do you go through her purse? Do you like start right. looking through things, paperwork and that so you can find out her name? Because you don't want to say the wrong name. And you certainly don't want to say, honey, <laughs> what was your name again? Yeah. That, that is just so awkward. And eventually it's going to come out. It's got to. Just human nature being what it is, eventually she's going to realize that this man that she's with right now is a different man than the one who went back in time. You know what I mean? Right. That stuff is just, you could write a whole nother volume, Harris, about that kind of stuff. And maybe he did. I mean, he's got a whole yeah, book, he's got a whole book filled with time travel stories. stories. And that, that is so cool. I, I, I've often thought about making my own story collections and what I would put in and, and, and having fun with, let's put a story collection together that's just this kind of story. 
going through and, and seeing what fits and what doesn't of your own work. So I'm jealous that he's already done that and that he's written 15 at least time travel stories. There was a movie that came out last year called About Time, and it didn't do well in the United States, and that's a shame because it was so good. Uh, it was done by Richard Curtis, who did Love Actually and uh, Notting Hill. And in that, a young man finds out that he's able to time travel back to earlier points in his life. And it's it's magical. It's not made with a time machine or with or you know, technology or chrono. Deep sea diving like suit. That. It's just magical. You can wish to be back on your eighth birthday, and suddenly you're back on your eighth birthday. And at one point, he tries to help somebody who's had a bad life. So he, you know, he I'm going to go back in time specifically to help this one person, and he does. He's able to sort that person's life out. That person has a messed up life. And then he goes back to the present and he finds out that the ramifications were great. And he has to make a decision. And to my surprise, he chose to F over this person that he had done all of this for before. He's just like, you know, I'm sorry, kind of thing. And I was just like, Whoa, really? He undid it all. And I could see in a sequel to Time Pressure... This same chrononaut going back, you know, even earlier, two days before he went to the Chinese embassy and, uh, you know, making sure that this terrorist didn't show up or didn't succeed in whatever he wanted, it, just so he could go back to the past he knew. Mm -hmm. So he could have his old wife back. So he could have his daughter instead of the son who is the fruit of his loins, but still isn't his son. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The kid's memories of playing baseball with his dad and staying up and doing fireworks and going fishing and all that stuff. He didn't do any of these things with the kid. I, I mean, he didn't have two sets of memories, right? No, he doesn't mention them. No, it's just, it's confusion. It's awkward and all that stuff. It, it, I think it would be natural for somebody to, to dwell on that forever and say, and of course, memory being what it is, you would romanticize the old life that you used to have. And the old wife that you used to have and the daughter that you used to have was so much cooler. And yeah. That is a downside to being able to travel in time <laughs> and that, that sort of thing. Yeah, messing it all up uh, is definitely an issue. Another thing that's nice about this story, and it's not nice, it's the opposite of nice really, but this, this seems like a very lonely profession, a lonely character. I mean, he's he's getting to travel through time and almost nobody gets to do that. But who would you be able to talk to afterward and say, you know, the car was red and now it's blue and the president was a woman and now it's a man? I mean, you I guess you could seek therapy and doctor-client privilege might prevent this from coming out. But who could understand what you had gone through? I mean, unless you could talk to a Chinese... Maybe there's, and say, maybe there's chrononaut. other chrononauts out there. I mean, like astronauts. Okay. I would guess that maybe they had a team of them. I mean, I'm sure they did training and tests and stuff like that. So it's not just the one guy in case they're about to go and he has a heart attack or something. Like, oh, well, that's the end of our program, everybody. Let's pack it up. And it's like the Chinese win after all. But at the same time, I don't feel like there's that kind of pressure on these guys. I mean, yes, there's competition with China, but it does. But, but yeah, it's been they, four years, I believe. I think it was longer than since that. China they said it was passed. like sixteen years that the record had stood. Oh, okay. You know, this might be toward the end of the Corona Knot program. You know what I mean? And there's not the funding that there used to be, and there's not so many kids that are just like, "I'm going to be a Corona Knot when I grow up." So I can go back in time and tell myself not to be a chrononaut. The <laughs> idea, and, and I don't know. These are just things I'm reading into it. Even the loneliness is something I'm reading into it. I don't know that it was there. Again, you could really expand on this, Harris. This could be a novella, if not a novel, I think. Sure. Just the history of this time travel program and the mistakes that maybe were made before this character entered into it things that we've learned by and then going into a bar where there are other chrononauts and each of them telling their stories of and then this changed and then i found out this and you 
<laughs> you're supposed to be dead. You died in a car accident in, you know, 2051. And here you are having a drink with me. And I don't know what I did to change that, but you're alive again. But those kind of conversations would have to happen. Right. <laughs> I right. mean, unless that does damage to somebody. How would you feel if somebody told you that you're alive again, you're supposed to be dead? Or, or in another timeline, you are dead and you're just here out of a fluke of happenstance. I don't know what I did yeah, to it's, make you alive again. That's just one of those things of time travel. I mean, in the whole idea of the quantum physics of, of time travel where the, it's basically like every possible decision that could have been made was made in both directions kind of a thing you know what I mean and there is a timeline somewhere where this decision was made there's a timeline where the other decision was made and there's just a bazillion you know it's like a, a tree with a jillion branches you know and that's how many timelines there are out there I can't remember, we did a story, I think, on the show once where they were talking about, you know, that they would go from one timeline to another or something like that. And sometimes the changes from one to the other would be so minimal that, you know, you wouldn't even notice unless you were there for a long time. And then you finally saw, oh, yeah, the car was blue. It used to be red. And that's the only difference. We picked a red car, but in this timeline, we picked a blue car. You know, and then there's the other ones where they'd be a more significant, you know, the difference could be some guy in China picked a red car. And so you would never know that that was the difference in the timeline. Uh, whereas, you know, it could be a much bigger difference. Like I married a different woman in this timeline and I, I had a son because we had sex five minutes later. Yeah, you talked about that, that there's a, a, a million sperm. Right. And it's just luck or nature, whatever you call it, survival of the fittest, that that sperm got to the egg first. Right. Like your, you, what was that movie called again? I always forget the name of it. In Time? Out of Time? About Time. About Time. And About Time where he can go back and change things in the past. You know, if you go back to your eighth birthday, you see, that, that's that's an idea that I have for a story that I mean to write at some point as a guy who goes back just like that to an earlier point of his life and then you know he, he does something differently but even if if you went back to a different to a part of your life and you had the memories you have now for one you can't remember the things that you did every little minute of every day to try and live it exactly the same as you did before it'd be 100 percent impossible and so if you went back to a time before say your child was born there's little to no chance that you would have the same child you know because you'd have to copulate at exactly the same time and you know do exactly everything the same which is impossible and so most likely your child even if it's still a girl will be a shorter girl with lighter hair or you know whatever would happen it would be something different so you think that that's basically what happened to this character? I think so, yeah. Something different. It's not a that... tiny little thing. Because World War III almost happened in 1995, he was living in a different place, and the woman he would have married was not there when he first would have met her and, and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, well, I think part of that, too, is that whole butterfly effect thing. You know, the, the butterfly's wings flapping here can cause a hurricane on the other side of the world because of the small changes eventually ripple, ripple, ripple and cause something much bigger. You know, it's that kind of a thing. Who knows what it could be? They found those explosives or whatever on the floor of the thing and so they changed security precautions and then you know people's lives were altered because of it and eventually you know down the line it caused him to marry a different woman and have a different child that's one of those things that would happen if you were to go back in time just even being there you know what i mean it's like the is it bradbury that wrote the story of the hunting the dinosaurs mm -hmm. it's okay. called the sound of thunder right yeah, I think so. Something like that. The one where they go back in time and they they set up a place so they never stepped on the ground. They were they were on this special sidewalk thing that was up in the air and they could only shoot the one dinosaur that they knew was going to die right then anyways. And all those things they had to do 
to not change anything in the past because if they changed anything, then, you know, the, the ramifications would be so great. And, yeah, when they change, they accidentally step on a butterfly and all the way in the future, they don't even speak the same language. The language on the posters is totally different and so on. Yeah, I mean, there's no way really to go back in time. Even just stepping on the ground when you go back in time now somebody hadn't stepped on the ground there before and now they did so it's different you've already aren't, changed aren't you giving an individual <laughs> way more credit than is, is... well uh, it, maybe it won't make a difference it won't make much of a difference but it's already different there's something different that happened just because you put a footprint there and maybe there was a bug in the dirt that you stepped on, you know, like the butterfly in that story of uh, Ray Bradbury's, you know, it's the, the same kind of a thing. Something's going to change, and the smallest the thing small enough as you kill this one bug, well, that means that bug's never going to have the children that it would have had. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know what kind of a difference that would make, but it would make a difference for sure. Maybe you'd never notice it. Like I was saying, you know, maybe the, the the difference in the timeline is that the guy in China picked a red car instead of a blue car. And so you had no idea, you know, you never find out the difference. Yeah, because wouldn't a lizard eat that butterfly in three days anyway? Possibly. And if not, that butterfly is going to die at the end of the season anyway because it's a butterfly. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying that Bradbury is wrong or that he's a hack or even that he's dead. But you're not saying that? it's uh, on three. Everybody pointed Rish and laughed. There's probably a lot of places mankind could go in time travel and affect nothing. Yeah, you would affect nothing or little. The, the effect you would make would be small enough that it wouldn't matter. And perhaps only one or two people would ever know the difference or notice it or whatever. But, you know, people make decisions every day in a small decision. You know, you could decide to go to work, you're on your way out the door, and then you're like, oh, wait, I need to grab a water bottle and take it with me. And so you run and get a water bottle. And had you not stopped to get that water bottle, then you would have driven into that one spot and been hit by a car. Whereas, you know, because you did, you weren't there a minute earlier, and so the car that blew through the stop sign hit nobody. Yeah, but life being what it is, you're only aware of that when you get hit. Right. And you think, oh, if I, I considered for a second going and getting a water bottle. <laughs> yeah, I should have If I had it. done it, I would be alive today. Which is odd, an odd thought to have. <laughs> that's the thought you would have. But yeah, that's the way, I guess, cause and effects are. There's, you know, the whole quantum thing, the every choice can you know i i can't imagine what that would really be like though can you imagine how many bajillion timelines if every single thing you do the fact that i didn't just hit stop on the recording and i keep recording with you now is different somewhere else i was like you know what we need to stop now and i turned it off and the timeline yeah. was different i may have to call hogwash <laughs> i almost said hogwarts I may have to call hogwash on that whole uh, quantum physics thing. I'm sorry if there are Brian Lincolns out there who actually <laughs> understand this stuff. I'm going to say no, that doesn't exist. Sorry. You say there's only one timeline? Yeah. That, yeah, I'm saying it. I'm, I'm, I'm making a stand. How dare you? I, I don't think that alternate timelines should be taught in school. <laughs> I think that's all a theory. And uh, I refuse to let my children participate in such discussions. There's only one timeline, and it is all about me. Okay. The Parsec-nominated Dune Steve team, folks. I don't know if anybody listening uh, has seen Vsauce YouTube videos. If you haven't, you should. Vsauce, they, they talk about a lot of concepts that are similar to this, and he presents them in a very entertaining way. But yeah, that was one of the things that he was talking about is just what is real and how can you know what is real? And basically there is no way to prove things are real and not just only existing inside your head because the only way you can perceive it is through your own senses. Yeah. And uh, 
I swear I saw a movie that was that way once where there was a guy and he was doing stuff and then at one point like everything freezes and there's some character comes out and tells him that yeah you know you are the world everything that is here is is created by you it's all there to interact with you and you can make it do whatever you want and all that kind of stuff <laughs> it's one of those weird ideas how can you there's no way to prove that you're not in the matrix to the point where somebody used that as their defense i guess in a uh I'm like a, a murder, murder trial or something like that they said they thought they were in the matrix and they were found not guilty by means of insanity. So yeah, don't try the Matrix uh, defense unless you you know want to be in an asylum for a long time. But it might work if you do want to be in an asylum. <sighs> do you have more to say? Fudge no. Are we ready to call it a episode? I'm ready to fart again. Oh, no. All right. Uh, I think we've probably sort of talked this one to death. Uh, and yet this is a subject where we could go on and on and on. We could give a bunch of different examples and we could do a bunch of what ifs and come up with other ideas for stories that you would like to write and I would like to write. Everybody write a time travel story. This is your assignment for this week, kiddies. <laughs> you and I both wrote a time travel story like as a broken mirror exercise uh -huh. where it had to end the same way <laughs> and that was really fun we should do that again that was before the noon steve when we had time yeah that was before the dark times before the empire okay now folks uh we're going to pause in the podcast just just for a minute mm -hmm. and for the very final time we're going to ask <laughs> big Dune Steve, this word Dune Steve that we got our title from. Oh, right. It just irritates the pee out of me to Ooh. not know what Dune Steve means. This word. Uh -huh. what, wh where does that come from? Uh, you know, I actually, he's a hero of mine. Donovan Hadley Dune Steve was the man that uh, I named the, the show after. Okay, and what is he famous for? Well, he was the first man to refer to Canada as the 51st state. Oh. That guy's been a hero of mine for decades. Well, consider him a hero of mine as yeah, well. he changed my life. <laughs> and that, folks, is the last time we will ever do that joke. Mark, mark your calendars, write in your blogs and journals, <laughs> hug your children a little tighter tonight. All right, folks, thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield asking you to donate to the show. So that's another thing Scott Sigler told us. Was there anything else Scott Sigler told us that we should share with the people before we go? Uh, Scott Sigler said we should measure our penis length and share that with the audience every uh, episode. Shoot, you're right. He did say that. But again, maybe he was looking at the guys behind us. Oh, he probably and, uh, was. I'm going to choose to believe that this time it was those guys he was looking at and not us. <laughs> Um, but he did also tell us to put out more episodes, and so we are trying. So there you go. There's more to come, therefore. Tune in next time for more Dune Steve. Thanks for listening, everyone. Good night. See you. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Time is flowing like a river to the sea. Don't know if I'm elated or gassy. Well, I guess that answers that. Cause for the first time in forever, I shat my pants. The computer is on, the mics are out. Announcer man's not whining. I'm, I'm too wow. high. You're way higher than you were last I went up a whole octave. <laughs> yes, I, you did. Because I was trying to match her. The computer is on, the mics are you're, out, you're I'm still again. doing it all the way up there. No, uh, let me look real quick, because he's a returning author, and so that should mean he's done other stories. I think we've done two of his stories before. And we still don't know his name?
<laughs> yes, Tobias. 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 Oh, no, he's done. Wait. Why is his name on here? Maybe he's done voices too. The Last Words of Daniel Schupach <laughs> by Eric William Bergmeier. What has that got to do with Harris Tobias? Maybe he did a voice on it. Oh, El Scribe Harris. Tobias. And Tobias Queen was in it. Uh. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> oh, he did the Alcarm <laughs> and the Troop. I thought he did. Which one it was the Troop? It had to be you. The Troop was the one that Tobias Queen Never produced. Tobias, and yeah, and Harris Tobias wrote. And. The it had to be and the Alcarm is the one where the dragon's going to attack when you? the bells start ringing when the bell yeah the bells Have bells 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 what was that one called it wasn't called it had to be you it was I have to it's, be you it's I gotta be you I gotta be you who did that one I think that was somebody. Ah, Peter E. Abresh. So Ningang is who did that one. Okay, we're back. And now a word about the author. I am very pleased and proud that my story time pressure is going to be produced by the Dune Steve team. I agree to the terms of your contract, including the mandatory castration. It's just chemical castration, Harris. Don't be worried. Here is my author's bio. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.